Hello everyone, today we're going north and uh, we will look at uh, one of the most extraordinary geniuses of all time and his name is Rembrandt van Rijn. He was born in the town of uh, Leiden. Uh, he was a son of uh, a miller and a baker's daughter <laughs> and to an extent it uh, reflects on his face. Looks a bit uh, Look, looks a bit like a loaf. He was not an attractive man by any consideration. His parents clearly had um, ambitions for him because they sent him to the University of Leiden, which was very famous, but uh, he had other ambitions for himself and instead apprenticed himself to a painter, a local painter of uh, relative mediocrity then uh, later on he decided that he really must go to Amsterdam. All along and throughout his entire life, in fact, he will be painting self-portraits. He will be studying his face. And as a young man, it's as if he was studying his development, his success, because once in Amsterdam he'll become an an immediate success. He will, everybody will want him to paint their portraits and he will portray himself as he becomes more and more successful. With time, however, and with fate interfering that we'll be looking at, his self-portraits will become more and more introspective as opposed to exhibiting his uh, worldly success it will, they will start exhibiting his inner philosophy. But here we have it from the very early on, as we see he is very interested in the effects of life and his brush is very painterly. Interestingly, he will never go to Italy. He will not be, just will not be interested in um, what Italy had to offer he will ultimately become one of the most human of all painters. These are, now he was born, as you see, in 1606, and by the standards of the time, when he died in 1669, at the age of 63, he was an old man. Not many people lived that long. As uh, when he came to Amsterdam, he began to, as I said, paint these portraits. And, um, and it's very clear that uh, from the portraits that his sitters did not really demand flattery. Uh, here we see a scholar who is at his work and Rembrandt will always, as a young man, as a young painter, be interested in action. And in this case, it looks like uh, an instantaneous photography. It's, it's as if he caught the scholar as he is distracted by someone while very much preoccupied with his studies. He even painted his uh, mouth slightly open as if in surprise and then, uh, and then the light falls on his face on these, this enormous volume and on an expensive rug. Uh, he also wears uh, nice stuffs and, uh, and that of course shows that he is a wealthy scholar and, uh, and that was quite important. Here is another painting, it's called Men in an Oriental Dress. Rembrandt will be fascinated with anything exotic and uh, the Near East will fascinate him. He, he will go to every auction in Amsterdam, he will buy anything and everything he could. As I said, he became quite successful and was quickly becoming wealthier and wealthier. He was fascinated by antique busts, uh, Near Eastern dress, any kind of uh, paraphernalia that struck his fancy and that he also felt, of course, he could use in his paintings. And here, indeed, he is using it. Uh, there's this spectacular, luxurious turban that the man is wearing. Also, also the cape uh, with some beautiful jewelry. And it seems already from the very beginning that Rembrandt's brush was loaded 
with light. It seemed that uh, his pigment already had some, some sort of phosphoretic material in it because he had this remarkable ability to apply the color to his subjects and make it and make it shine, make it see-through, make it uh, brilliant. And this is what we see from the very beginning. Uh, Nicholas Rutz was a merchant, uh, a contemporaneous merchant, who dealt with Russia and he dealt in furs and therefore Rembrandt puts him in a Russian furs, in the greatest of Russian furs, the sable. And uh, here he is wearing this, uh, this very, very heavy, very expensive coat that's trimmed with the sable and what appears to be some kind of a Russian hat. Um, not as many, uh, as many texts claim that he is wearing the very typical Russian hat, which is called the ear hat, Ushanka. That's not the one, but it could be some sort of a Russian hat, without question. And then, uh, and then the frill around the neck that was very much in fashion at the time. The man turns around, he has some sort of bill of sales in his hand. He doesn't quite look at us, it's almost as if he, in fact, is looking at someone that he is dealing with. In so many portraits of Rembrandt, he presents his sitters in the middle of negotiations, in the middle of actions, in the middle of some sort of activity. The human element will always be there. The formal element will always be subordinated to the human element. And you see it in Rembrandt from the very, very early on. Uh, and speaking of uh, an activity, a human activity, one of his first commissions, official commissions, not just a portrait commission, but an official commission, was from um, the, uh, uh, the, the Guild of the Surgeons. And this guild, it appears, commissioned a portrait about every five years from one artist or another to do a group portrait. And, um, and this time, now Rembrandt, uh, born in also, he's only 26 years old, he's very much a young man, and he is given this extremely prestigious commission to do a group portrait of, uh, of surgeons who are in the um, uh, anatomy, anatomy room and listening to a lecture on anatomy from a very distinguished man a very distinct, distinguished surgeon by the name of Nicholas Tull. And uh, here is uh, the man himself. Uh, in front of him is a cadaver. And at this point, the anatomical um, studies used cadavers of executed criminals. And uh, this particular man, actually, we know his name, and uh, he uh, murdered someone and was executed and he was hanged and now he is used, he is given to the surgeons to examine. Interestingly, uh, the, the so-called preparer is not in the portrait because uh, someone of the standing of uh, Dr. Tulp would not, in fact, be cutting the cadaver himself. Would be someone else doing the job. And now the job is done, the man is not in the portrait, and uh, the doctor with his pincers, he's, uh, he's lifting part of the arm in order to show it to the, uh, to the viewers. And there's also an enormous volume on anatomy right next to him. So both of the, so when you see these men, they're not only looking at the arm, they're also looking at the volume, comparing, comparing reality with the, uh, with the written text. It is a very different group portrait from uh, uh, from previous examples. In previous examples, and I will show you later, in previous examples all people sort of look uh, outside onto the viewer, everyone is given identical prominence and everyone is portrayed from uh, a relatively uh, identical viewpoint. And, uh, and usually they pose. They don't just do something and involve in themselves. They pose for the painter, not in this case. He portrays them 
in the middle of the examination, in the middle of uh, the, uh, the, the lesson, and everyone is differently fascinated by the lesson. Here is the doctor himself, the light falls uh, uh, directly on the cadaver, and then also on the doctor, and then all the other men, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, they will all pay for being in the portrait and then pay considerably, including the doctor himself, because this was a great privilege to, uh, to have oneself in one of those official portraits that hung in the guild's um, building. And here they are. And you see how they're looking at the book, so many. And one man here is taking notes. Uh, and the other one is kind of staring into the distance. They're all curious, uh, uh, very curious about the book and about the anatomy. But Rembrandt does not portray them all frontal, as, uh, as in the case of uh, this man, this, these are frontal. But then uh, this man is in profile, so is this. And uh, the doctor himself is sort of in a three-quarter view. These were also wonderful social occasions, so everybody dressed in their Sunday best to participate in these anatomical lessons. They were, as I said, they were social occasions. The, um, soon after arrival in Amsterdam, he will marry, he will marry Saskia, Saskia van Eulenburg. And um, it was definitely love at first sight, and it was also mutual love. But um, it also so happened that she was an heiress. Uh, and with him doing so incredibly well in Amsterdam, and with her bringing all the money of an heiress, the couple did extremely well. There was, uh, was just really happy existence. Uh, this incredibly successful painter um, received everywhere a rich, beautiful young wife and he was so in love, he painted her so often. He, uh, he painted her, he drew her, he made etchings. Uh, Saskia was everywhere. And, uh, and here's one of them, of Saskia, in a straw hat. It's as if wherever they went, if they went to the picnic, he just never tired of, uh, of painting Saskia. And uh, in this case, he's painting her as um, as the goddess of nature, as Flora, and there's just so much love uh, poured onto onto the canvas. She uh, she probably is pregnant at this point, and she is crowned with this abundance of beautiful flowers, and uh, uh, holding a staff, also from which from from which flowers hang down. She's wearing beautiful beautiful uh, dress. And uh, what is very interesting about this portrait is here. Um, sometime earlier, about 300 years earlier, uh, a, northern, a northern artist by the name of Jan, uh, Jan van Eyck painted his very famous Arnold Fini portrait. That, that was the painter in whose shop, presumably, oil paint was being used for the first time, because until then, Painters used fresco, fresco technique, which is uh, watercolors, essentially, or the temporary technique where you one suspends uh, pigment in an egg yolk. And uh, in Van Eyck shop, oils began to be used. But here he, uh, he paints a couple. Uh, they're an Italian couple living, uh, living in Bruges, I think. And uh, she seems, she appears to be pregnant, even though it's called variously Arnold Finney portrait or Arnold Finney wedding. But if it is a wedding, well, she, uh, she's, she seems to be pregnant already, even though at the time, in the 15th century, this also was a fashion for women to have an extended tummy, so perhaps the, those who weren't pregnant Perhaps they wore a bit of a pillow there, but then on the other hand, when the woman was married, she was pregnant all the time. Needless to say, uh, there were no contraceptives and uh, women had a lot of children. But here is the uh, portrait, and it was a very famous portrait, as I said, and uh, everyone knew about it. And here we have uh, 300 years difference. 
uh, Rembrandt, who paints Saskia as Flora, and Van Eyck, who, who paints the Arnolfini couple. And they seem to be quite similar. It seems that Rembrandt actually was looking at Arnolfini when he was painting Saskia. So not only he paints her with a tremendous, uh, just remarkable degree of love and affection, but he also wants clearly to hearken back to what for him, of course, was a very important painting and elevate his wife to the level of this greatness, in addition as to express his personal feelings uh, to her. Another one with Saskia, and he actually paints the two of them, uh, self-portrait with Saskia as a prodigal son in a brother. Very, we will remember this prodigal son when we see his return of prodigal son that he will paint later. Here he is a young buck, he is happy, he, uh, life is, just couldn't be better. And he is drinking his wine, his beer, whatever he is drinking here. He is um, in uh, the interior, is full of gorgeousness. There is a stuffed peacock, as appears to be there. Even, there even seem to be peacock feathers there. And gorgeous, just absolutely beautiful a rug on the table. Everything is beautiful. His sword creates a beautiful diagonal for the painting. So sort of the painting is stabilized from the compositional point of view. It's also, it's also quite lovely because uh, here with his glass of wine or beer, he establishes um, this, uh, the, the vertical anchor right here. And then this vertical anchor he is uh, he then modifies by a diagonal of his sword and then a beautiful well, baroque curtain. Uh, the light falls on their faces. It's a very unusual portrait again. I mean everything he does is very very unusual because it's he doesn't paint them as she, as she sits on his knees frontally towards us. She actually had to turn around to look at us. Uh, he does the same thing. So technically he is painting themselves from the back. But the, uh, the interesting detail here is that while from the back they're turning to look at us as if again they are having a lovely time and uh, someone walked in and, uh, and wished to, to join the company and both of them turn at us and the whole thing just becomes so much more personal. They turned at us, completely welcoming us into the scene. And he's happy. She's a little reticent. She's not as effusive as her husband, but, uh, but uh, she's sitting on his knees. She obviously is loving him and uh, is perfectly happy to oblige him, to uh, spoil him, to do anything, anything he wants. And thus, we are introduced into the portrait as participants, not just as observers. And there flickers his, his remarkable brush, as I said, full of light and joy at this point. So happy and wealthy they were, they, um, they in fact uh, bought a beautiful house in Amsterdam and here it is. Today it's a Rembrandt's museum and one can uh, look inside, one can go in. Uh, and he filled, absolutely filled this house with all sorts of bric-a-brac, with all sorts of paraphernalia, whether exotic clothes or antique busts or anything else that he could lay his hands on was all in this house. and. Uh, and in the uh, upstairs, in the last floor, um, he also turned it into sort of almost a warehouse where where these things uh, these things were. It's a It's not a Rubens's house. It's uh, Rembrandt never wished to be a diplomat, nor perhaps could he. And uh, and then, well, he lived in Holland, not in Belgium, which um, which separated itself from Spain, and. Uh, so the house 
even though it looks more modest than uh, Rubens' house, by Amsterdam standards, was considered one of the great, beautiful, luxurious houses. And it's beautiful here, here, you can see. Um, later on, we'll talk about uh, his later life, he will actually have to auction off much of, um, of his possessions. But today, to give us uh, an idea of what the house looks like. It is again filled with some of the antique busts, with some uh, things that uh, Rembrandt found fascinating. Uh, he also had his, uh, his printing uh, table there and his printing wheel right there and this all had been set up. Uh, I mean the house itself was sold. He sold the house so, to somebody else. But then clearly the government just bought the house and, uh, and all it's owned by the government and it's turned into Rembrandt's museum. And then the trustees obviously attempted to restore it to as much as possible the idea of what it looked like while Rembrandt lived there. In his youth, uh, as I said, he was uh, very fascinated by... Uh, by everything exotic. He also was very fascinated by, by movement, by powerful physical energy um, released by sort of a violent action in space. And that is what you see here in the case of uh, Belshazzar's feast. Um, Belshazzar was actually not a king himself, but he was the son of um, uh, Nabonidos, who was uh, the last king of Babylon, but then when Nabonidos uh, was off on his travels, he delegated to his son the rule of, uh, of Babylon. Rembrandt was also always interested in uh, stories in the Bible, their drama, their human theater, their expressiveness, their mystery, all of that fascinated Rembrandt. And here is uh, a biblical story uh, about uh, Belshazzar, as I said, the son of uh, Nabonidus, who was the last king of Babylon. And um, he uh, had this great feast and uh, invited hundreds of people to the feast. Uh, at which he used uh, vessels that were taken from uh, the original uh, Jerusalem temple, the temple of Solomon, and he was boasting what, uh, what remarkable vessels they were, how rich they were, how about 70 years ago, how the uh, Jerusalem was uh, captured by the Babylonians and the Jews were taken into the Babylonian exile. And uh, it was at that feast that suddenly, suddenly uh, the uh, hand of God appeared and wrote these words in Hebrew on the wall. And of course the entire company is completely stunned by this and by this miracle. And uh, no one can interpret it. He asks all his scholars, uh, Belshazzar, but no one can read it. At which point then he summons Daniel. And Daniel then comes and reads the words, Mene Mene Tekel Ufarsim. And then he interprets the words. Mene means God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. And then the second word, Tekel, you have been weighted and found wanting. And then the third word means your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And sure enough, Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon and then Babylon will be conquered by the Persians and the Medes and then the Jews were allowed to go back to Jerusalem from, uh, from their Babylonian captivity. So that is the story. But uh, Rembrandt uses it as, uh, as a revelation of a tremendous drama, of, uh, of uh, remarkable uh, colors, uh, of, uh, to show spectacular clothes, all the splendor of unparalleled 
beauty. Turbans, loved turbans, just as we saw in his uh, portrait of a man with a turban. And here's Saskia, right there, who is um, one of the invited guests. These are the scholars, clearly, who could not, uh, who could not read the, uh, uh, the words. And uh, the face, the face of uh, Belshazzar himself, I mean, the, the arms are open the face turned and the face exhibit not only not only extraordinary surprise but also fear because um, this is this is a miracle and uh, it's just a beautiful beautiful painting and compositionally he places Belshazzar in the middle and he embraces the space of the painting with his arms and with all this incredible luxury and then on the side uh, there's a different group of people who perhaps, I mean, there was one scholar, it seems, and then a woman, and a woman, and then there's a woman here uh, as well. You see, uh, and you see these beautiful golden vessels, because these are the vessels from the from um, Jerusalem temple. Uh, also at the same time, approximately, yes, the same year, in fact, uh, his, this, this, uh, interest of his in action, in action, in space, shows brilliantly in um, his sacrifice of um, his sacrifice of Isaac. He took the um, uh, the idea of a knife falling out of um, Abraham's hand from a contemporaneous play, actually by a French playwright, in which he has the knife uh, fall out of Abraham's hand. And that's, uh, but it also, because it's curved, the knife, it sort of creates uh, compositionally a circle in the middle of the painting while both the, um, uh, the body of Isaac and, uh, and the body of uh, the angel uh, create delineations in the painting. So, so two diagonals and then there is a, uh, a circle. He also conveys this... Um, savage efficiency with which Abraham was prepared to cut the throat of his own son when the way that he he pulls it down and uh, I mean this is his own son he has he seems to have absolutely no hesitations at at cutting that beautiful smooth neck right here and uh, and then the background looks almost a little Leonardesque if um, we may say so. Even though, as I said, uh, Rembrandt uh, never went to Italy, he uh, was completely untouched by um, the standards of ideal classicism. And, uh, and as a result, by those ideals, he never really uh, drew or painted an ideal figure. And again, by the same standards, never painted a beautiful one by classical ideals. He, um, he wasn't interested. He was interested in uh, painting what he saw and he was interested in painting humanity as he saw it. And now here is very biblical, of course, and, uh, but beautifully, beautifully organized and as I said, what, what, sh what is shown here in the uh, body of Isaac. Uh, this this almost brutal efficiency with which Abraham was indeed uh, prepared to to do the deed, and the angel is almost scolding him as he is holding his hand, and with his uh, with his other hand he uh, literally is what are you doing? I mean, I, yes, uh, of course uh, God wished to test you, but you don't have to be quite so energetic about the whole business. Uh, Considerably later, this is 35, this is 20 years later, uh, one of his etchings, he does the same theme again, and it is very different. Um, there is no efficiency in the father. By this time, Rembrandt will experience losses, uh, and his life will be changed, uh, but his um, interest in humanity will only be deepened. And his, um, 
his interest in the relationship of father and son will be deepened remarkably. And there will be many uh, pieces of art from him that deal with that relationship of father and son. And here you have um, an exhausted old man who clearly has such grave doubts about the deed he must do, who has to choose between between the love for his only son from Sarah and his obedience to God. You see the torture he had gone through. It's almost as if he had become old right there and then. His knife is in his uh, left hand, but nowhere is he uh, uh, about to cut the boy's throat. If anything, his hand is covered by the angel's hand, and both hands cover the eyes of the boy, so that uh, the boy shouldn't see what is happening. And uh, the whole scene is so much full of psychological drama now, as opposed to physical drama. In this painting, what we see is, um, uh, is this powerful physical drama. Uh, the turns of the bodies, the, uh, uh, the uh, unhesitant movement of Abraham. Uh, however, in, in the etching that we're looking at that was created 20 years later, it's not the physical drama we're watching, we're watching the psychological drama now. And that will be the evolution of Rembrandt. Uh, here you have them together. This is 1635 and 1655. Great interest in physicality, great interest in psychology. But it wasn't that he wasn't interested in psychology in his early years um, also. Unlike uh, someone like Rubens that we looked at and uh, many other Baroque painters, who, uh, who, who mixed, they mixed the angels and allegories and human beings and divine apparitions. It was all, all uh, merry company together. That wasn't the case with Rembrandt. He was, um, he was fascinated by mystery and mystical apparitions and he painted them as such. And to him, uh, are the angels or, or holy personage uh, were a separate group of um, existence. And as such, he paints them as a separate group of existence. Here, for instance, is one of his very early representations of uh, supper at Emmaus, and that is Jesus after his resurrection. He is at Emmaus and he sits uh, at a table with uh, some of his uh, former disciples and uh, then he reveals to them who he was. And in this case, uh, Rembrandt only shows one person here and the effects of light that he is studying uh, the, the light clearly comes from the candle. We don't see the candle. It's not quite Georges de Latour, even though the interest in candlelight is the same as in Georges de Latour. But he is interested already this early, because he's only 22 years old here, and, uh, but he's already interested in psychology of uh, mysticism. And here, what we see, it's, it's, it's as if we are, we are another disciple sitting on the other side of Christ. And again, we are participating in the drama. We see not the man himself, but the apparition, the mysterious apparition of the man, while uh, the man across from him is, uh, is shocked by the revelation and looks at him with this mixture of uh, belief and disbelief. But we believe because we are sitting on the other side and uh, are looking at, uh, at the shadow, at the mystifying shadow. There's also uh, a servant in the background 
who has absolutely no idea what is going on. She is preoccupied with, uh, with her own business in the back of the tavern and we are left together with these two. He will paint this theme again 20 years later. Here we have two examples. One is in Copenhagen, the other one is in the Louvre. I actually prefer the one from uh, 28. But here he decided to, uh, in one case here, he decided to place Jesus in a niche, and a niche provides this uh, almost throne-like impression, and in fact uh, give him two people instead of giving him us and the other person. He actually gives him two of his disciples and there's a servant and this is the moment at which he reveals who he is and as he reveals it that's when the halo appears around his head and the two disciples are aghast and uh, surprised, uh, disbelieving and at the same time believing while the servant seems again just not even to notice. It's the world of these three and even though the servant is there he is not an initiate and as a result he doesn't get to participate in the mystery as the other two do. And the same year he paints still another one uh, with uh, two who seem to be in fact uh, similar to these other ones and, uh, and two women on the side upon which he places the light at two. And while uh, these two are surprised, they are just uh, quietly listening. It almost seems that while the men are disbelieving, in this case it's almost as if he paints the women as the true disciples who accept the revelation without any doubt whatsoever or without any surprise. And here are all three of them. Uh, the one that he painted in 28 and the two others that he painted in uh, uh, 20 years later. He was, this was a commission. He did paint uh, commission works and this was a commission from a, a very wealthy man in, uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, this is a scene of uh, the blinding of uh, Samson. And the, the story is that Samson is one of the last or the last judge of, um, of Israel. He uh, has tremendous strength. His strength in, fa in fact resides in his hair and uh, his lover is Delilah. In some accounts she's his wife. And Delilah is Philistine and, uh, and the Philistines who want him deprived of his power and his strength set Delilah to wait for him to go to sleep and then cut his hair, which is what she does, at which point the Philistines jump on top of him and blind him. Uh, because he is now powerless without his hair, they uh, send him to grind grain in Gaza, but then at some point he claims to be tired, so they bring him to some sort of a temple where a number of these soldiers uh, also exist and but his hair had grown by that time and what he does he uh, breaks the columns of uh, the temple and then the whole structure collapses onto himself but also onto the Philistines. The uh, story here is uh, the moment is that of blending and uh, and here certainly you can see how how interested Rembrandt is in action painting and in action painting, in fact, in space, as I said before. Here, it drills into the canvas with the figure of Samson here into the space of the canvas. Again, he paints Saskia here as Delilah, who is running away with the hair of uh, Samson, and then the Philistines, dressed in uh, spectacular armor, are actually and extremely realistically gorging Samson's eyes out, as you see it here. The light from the painting comes from, from beyond the painting, from that space into which Saskia escapes. That's how the painting is lit from the back. Uh, 
here are the very, very gory details. Very physical, very gory details right here. And of course the light plays on the surfaces because, uh, well, Rembrandt loves surfaces as well and uh, clearly takes uh, great delight in painting different surfaces and the reflection of light uh, thereupon. Uh, here is one of the soldiers right here. He is right, this is a, we see his hands here as he is holding uh, Samson and then another as he is in fact uh, blinding him. Here is Saskia as she's running away with her hair. And uh, here is the scissors. And then you see Samson's feet. The horrendous pain that he is experiencing uh, that we see not only in his face and, uh, and his body that is thrashing as a result of pain, but also that uh, his, his toes that are uh, crunched in pain. Very impressive, but, uh, uh, but also very physical. Here is another prodigal son, which um, is very different, of course, from this prodigal son that we saw when Rembrandt paints himself as the prodigal son with Saskia on his knees. This is a very different prodigal son. Uh, here is the boy who, who spent all his inheritance, he has nothing to live on anymore, and uh, who then repents and comes back home. And the physicality is here also portrayed as both of them, the father and the son, rush towards one another. The son in sincere repentance and the father in sincere welcome. And the two of them are united uh, together. Saskia will uh, die 36, about six years later. Um, the uh, two of them will have four children, but three of them will die in uh, infancy. But the fourth, uh, a boy by the name of Titus, was, um, did survive. And, uh, and the relationship between Rembrandt and Titus was extremely close and extremely warm. And uh, one can see that love, that affection, that closeness in here as well. So Rembrandt has his signature here, and here is the relationship between father and son. Uh, the, um, the etching is done with these very beautiful, very precise lines where a true emotion is expressed through a very cohesive, very expressive line and the, the lines almost seem to fly above the paper in, uh, in this case. Uh, the background is sketched just so very lightly and all the attention of course is, is paid to the central pair.